Hello, Endeavor here. So we're back again with Morgoth and Endeavor's classic movies. And today we're going to be reviewing a movie. I don't know if it can be considered classic, but uh, in Poland, it certainly is a classic. It's a foreign movie, came out in 2007. And we're going to be reviewing the Polish World War II film called Katyn. It's about the Katyn massacre. So it's a really interesting one to get into. How are you doing tonight, Morgoth? I'm doing good. I've been, I've been, I've been uh, quite busy today, so I'm a little bit tired. But uh, I feel, I feel weird. I feel like I'm out of my comfort zone because classic movies is on at half past seven and not like in the afternoon. I, I feel like I should have my cocoa and my pajamas on at this time of night. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm all right. Yeah, I, yeah. I just had something that that came up for me today, so we had to uh, schedule it a bit later. But um, anyway. Uh, to get into the movie, so it's about the Katyn massacre, which took place in 1940 in World War II, and I'll give uh, I'll give a brief uh, summary of the historical event itself, which this film is based on. Uh, so, as everyone knows, in September 1939, Poland was invaded by both Germany and the Soviet Union, who had signed a non-aggression pact, and they carved the country in half. The Germans took the western half, and the USSR took the eastern half of Poland and this you know started World War II when Britain and France declared war on Germany but not the USSR uh, so during this invasion which only lasted um, a couple of a couple of weeks not the, the Poles weren't able to hold out for very long uh, hundreds of thousands of Poles were taken prisoner both by the Germans in the West and by the Soviets in the east and um, so the, the, uh, there was a huge number of Polish uh, army officers who were taken prisoner uh, by the Soviet Union and uh, about 10, uh, over 10,000 of them. And they were moved to camps within the Soviet Union to places like uh, Kalinin, which is now called Tver today, uh, near Smolensk and near Kharkov, which is now in present day Ukraine. The other two are in present day Russia. Uh, and in spring of 1940 several months after the invasion uh the soviets were trying to consolidate power in poland so the eastern half of poland was annexed to the soviet union and it remained so uh to this day actually uh the eastern what was eastern poland in 1939 is now part of ukraine and belarus today uh and they wanted to consolidate power in this area in this new area so um the prisoners who they had captured, many of whom were uh, officers in the Polish army, but also they had, they captured intellectuals, business owners, landowners, uh, lawyers, a a anyone who was like, like, like basically the Polish elite. So basically anyone of stature in Poland uh, who they were, who they were able to get into their captivity. Uh, they, um, Beria, the leader of the NKVD at the time, suggested to Joseph Stalin that basically they just liquidate all these prisoners and Stalin signed off on that in uh, spring in April and May of 1940 uh, these prisoners were executed and the most famous one was the uh, the army officers who were held near Smolensk who were, the, were taken out to the Katyn forest and shot in the back of the head basically so uh, thousands upon thousands of them but there were also massacres who which took place in other areas near Kharkov near Tver but um they became collectively known as the Katyn massacre the about 22,000 prisoners uh Polish pr prisoners were killed in the spring of 1940 by the Soviet Union this was before the Germans and the Soviets were at war so um this was uh when the non-aggression pact was in in place so, uh, as everyone knows, in uh, summer 1941, the Germans launched Operation Barbarossa, the, inv the invasion of the Soviet Union. And uh, at the time, uh, the Polish government in exile, which was based in London, uh, began uh, diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. And they said they'd work together to uh, defeat the Germans. And they had asked, uh, well, you know, these officers who you had captured, uh, well, maybe can you release them? We could, we could use them. They'd be really useful for, uh, for our collective uh, fight. But they, uh, I think that the, that the Soviet excuse was that they had either lost track of them or they had escaped or something. They said that we, we don't, we don't have a, they're not accounted for. We can't find them. Uh, so in February of 1943, this was uh, over a year into uh, Operation Barbarossa in the occupied land of the Soviet Union the, that the Germans occupied, uh, they discovered the, the Wehrmacht discovered uh, mass graves in the Katyn forest near Smolensk. 
uh, and they discovered thousands of Polish officers who had been killed and um, shot in the back of the head, dumped into these mass graves and just buried there. Uh, and the Germans found this very useful because it was a way of driving a wedge between Poland, the USSR and the Western allies. So they allowed the uh, uh, neutral journalists and the Red Cross full access to the mass graves. And they publicized it around the world. They uh, publicized this in Poland. They gave, they gave lists of men who were known to have died in the massacre. And they, um, they basically did this huge expose of, um, of this event. Then uh, two, uh, about two years later, as, as it would happen, the uh, Soviet Union defeated the Germans. They uh, swept across, they pushed them out of their territory and then eventually swept across uh, Eastern Europe and ended up uh, occupying Poland. Now, here's the problem, like they're trying to set up a pro-communist uh, Polish government, a communist Polish government, a pro-Soviet one in, uh, in Poland, which they now occupied. Problem is that they had just like massacred tens of thousands of their, of, you know, the, the, the Polish elites, the upper uh, class of uh, Polish society, the officers, lawyers, business owners and such. So they basically then they had, they had, they created their own narrative. The Soviets created their own narrative and they said, well, it was actually the Germans who had killed these uh, Polish officers in uh, summer and fall of 1941 after Operation Barbarossa. Uh, and um, everyone in Poland knew this was not true. Uh, but it be, but now that Poland was under communist rule, it actually, this became the official narrative that Ka that the Katyn massacre was committed by the Germans. And uh, it became illegal in Poland to claim otherwise. And uh, I know, I think that even in the USSR, it was illegal to even talk about the Katyn massacre. Um, and the lie persisted for decades. It wasn't until 1990, as the Soviet Union was about to fall, that uh, Mikhail Gorbachev released documents confirming that Stalin had uh, ordered the massacre of the uh, of the 22,000 Poles and the USSR admitted responsibility. And I think it was in 2010 that the Russian Duma officially denounced Joseph Stalin for ordering the massacre. So this film is really interesting. It's a, It's about the... The, the film is about uh, this historical event. And before I get into it, I actually do want to make one caveat because it's such a, uh, it's such a hot topic that um, I, I want to say that like, I don't like hold any like grudges about of, towards any side that, that was involved in this conflict today. Um, as everyone knows, like I, I love Russia. I consider myself a friend of the Russian people. I've lived in Russia for several years. Uh, and I don't think that today they, anyone in Russia should feel guilty in the least over this. But at the same time, it might also surprise people to know that I actually um, knew someone who uh, was related to the to uh, the Katyn massacre. Uh, my boyhood hero was an elderly Polish man who lived in my neighborhood, and uh, he was and when he was a teenager, he fought in the Polish home, home army during World War II, and his father was actually taken out to, was one of the officers who was shot in the Katyn forest, and uh, he was forced to leave Poland after the war during due to the communist takeover. So, you know, I, I have sympathies with, uh, you know, both uh, these two nations. I don't like, you know, and I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to use this as like an indictment against either of them in the present day. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, as for the movie itself, so I'll, I'll, I've been talking for a while, so I'll pass it over to Morgoth. What did you think of this movie? Well, when, we, when you proposed this movie, I kind of dragged me feet because I know that this... I, I, when you're talking about, um, well, you're talking about the Bolshevik Revolution, you're talking about World War II, the invasion of Poland, and then you also have to tick the box, though we can't really do it on YouTube, for the presence of somebody like Beria and his background and how that relates to the German invasion. You know, you've got to, you're, you're walking on ice for so many of these issues on YouTube. So then you have to see how that connects to the German invasion of, say, Poland. And then, it, 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 like, there's so many red flags all over the place with this subject. And when it was like, you were like, let's do Katya, and I was like, oh, God, I'm going to... But in, in like, um, <laughs> I was oh, this, this, is, this is just a nightmare. Because everybody's got their own... <clears throat> everybody's got their own narrative that they want to read into this. Everybody ha Everybody has a kind of vested interest in who did what to who in this particular um, part of the world during these decades, not just this 
not not even just World War uh, Two itself or the invasion of Poland, but what were led up to it, what led up to the Bolshevik Revolution, what happened after it. It's it's so it's got it, it's such a everybody has got their own dog in the fight on this kind of issue. Just about so a lot of people in our circles as well. And I used to um I, I used to read up on this subject a lot. I was fascinated by the Soviet Union. I mean, we can get into all that later. But as for the the movie itself, it is like centered on the Polish experience, and I think it's it's. Just as, a, first of all, before we get all carried away, like, the film itself is just, it's very grim, but the cinematography and, and it, it comes across as, like, a very serious film, which is pitched at a high IQ. And when I was watching it, then the various characters, so it, main, you, you can kind of parse it. It's mainly two different things happening. You get the perspective of the officers, and what goes on with them after they've been captured. Um, and then you also get it from what you can think of as being kind of back in the normal world, um, which is the wives, the mothers, and then the daughters of the men who want to know what's going on. And this kind of bleeds into a, a wider kind of discussion on how the Poles themselves are coping with this. Because, you know, the, the armies are... what like it starts off where the Germans are in it quite a bit at the start. And then they, they, that they kind of, they leave the scene as the movie goes on. And for the bulk of it, it's that the Soviets have come back in. So it starts off with the Soviets coming in, the Germans push them out and then the Germans themselves get pushed out. And so in the middle of this, they've, they've got to kind of keep switching their, like how they survive in this world. Um, where, where you, you literally just get dragged off to a concentration camp or shot if you don't go along with the power that's in at that moment, and then you bring in the Katian thing. So, but I, I, I do, I do love the look of these movies. I mean, it looks so crisp, and and to, like I don't know why, but it's a, something you can relate to. You know, the streets are clean, and it's obviously it's like. It's got no diversity in whatsoever, and there's all these kinds of things, and 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 I think the the, the people that are the, that are portrayed in this, um, or I can relate to them more than what I see in Hollywood stuff. Not even just like the the cape shit stuff that you see, but I do I like a standard Hollywood kind of movie. I just can't relate to the people that are in it, even if it's like a kind of a serious thing. But here, I felt like I was watching real people. With like coming to terms with real difficult issues, really difficult issues under horrible circumstances. And I didn't feel like I was being spoken to like a moron either. I was keep having to kind of stop it and think, right, so how is this person related to that person? And and this kind of thing. It, it wasn't like speaking down to you like you are a retard. It was um and I appreciated that. And I think, well, the, you know, I'm gonna have to invest in it. So just as a movie, I think it was really great and I, about 25 minutes in i thought i can see where this is going now wow, this is this is good stuff this is really interesting yeah so I, I as a standalone movie it is actually great i think i need to add one caveat i i think for uh, beria wasn't actually of the tribe i do believe he was ethnically georgian i think that maybe you're thinking of kaganovich who he was involved in this and in, he, he oh, also played a role yeah. in it but I just wanted to, to clear that up, but like on that subject, I will say that um, I don't want to make this stream about that that because you know it's so easy to do that and it's so dangerous to do it on YouTube. But you know people get carried away on it. What I will say about on that subject though is that what's so fresh about this movie is that uh, it's actually about the Polish experience. Like I've seen dozens of World War II movies which take place in Poland. Uh, you know, Schindler's List, Pianist, The Zookeeper's Wife, you know where I'm going with these, but none of them are actually about, you know, the Polish people. Uh, they're always about a different group of people, and the reason Hollywood always makes them is that this is who controls Hollywood. Uh, but I'm not saying anything that anyone here doesn't know already. Uh, but what I wanted to, the, the point I wanted to make, though, is like what, what makes this an, a fascinating movie is that it actually is a movie made by Poles about uh, their own experience during World War II. Uh, rather than uh, like these Hollywood mo movies, which are being made by a hostile group in order to push guilt upon 
uh, Europeans collectively. So this one is is, is uh, free from that, which is why it's actually such a good movie. Uh, something that's also I, I also found really interesting is that the director. So um, I mentioned that my boyhood hero was a Polish uh, guy who fought in the war. Uh, the, the the director of this movie was actually born in the exact same year as as this man that I knew. Uh, he also served in the home army and his uh, father also was killed in the Katyn massacre. So, um, you know, I guess, I guess like I can see the perspective that w where this was coming from, like, uh, cause I've, I knew someone personally uh, in, I knew someone personally in my life who had a very similar life experience to the director. And uh, what, what it, what the movie shows is that it kind of goes against the good war myth because what Hollywood has done is they've created like this narrative around World War II that it was the good war, that it was the war that um, was against this, like, you know, the horrible fascists. And uh, it was the war where the there was good guys and bad guys and the bad guy, oh, sorry, and the good guys defeated the bad guys and that, uh, you know, we all lived happily ever after. That's basically the narrative that uh, Hollywood has pushed uh uh, on World War II, and this one completely uh, goes against that. Uh, it, and it's understandable from the Polish experience, it, World War II was anything but a good war. I mean, they were invaded right at the very beginning of it. Uh, they spent six years under occupation. Uh, it was a, I like uh, it was absolutely brutal, the entire war in Poland. And then uh, they just ended the war under another occupation. So, you know, they never actually uh, you know, they, they were never like, they, they, they were never like liberated or anything like that. What happened was they went from one occupation to another. So, um, and, and then that occupation, the, the communist occupation of Poland that lasted over 40 years. So, you know, you know, the, the people who are, who, um, who live, who lived through that war, many of them, you know, they never actually lived to see, um, uh, a Poland like the one which they had lost in 1939. So, um, like a huge percentage of their population died. And I, I know from, you know, this man I knew in my life, like some of the stories that he told were just absolutely horrendous. Uh, so, you know, it, it really just breaks that myth that World War II was this good war. It was absolutely not. And, uh, you know, the, this movie is so fresh because it's, it's, it's not like uh, trying, to, trying to push this false narrative. Well, it's, it's, it's difficult because for them to do that, because Poland was just the big loser. I mean, I remember one of the books that I read, he described it that the like the Nazis had stretched uh, Poland over the rack, and then like there was a surprise attack with the Soviets coming in from the other side. And when when you're already like flat out against on one front, and then like the 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 the, the steamroller comes in from the east, you can really just think like you well, what what are you going to do then like you're already being thrashed and then an even worse enemy comes in well you know depending on your perspective from mainly it's framed that to the polish people themselves um it doesn't make that much difference though as the movie goes on i think what it does very well it is it kind of builds this um aura of of something really dark about the Soviet Union itself in a way that it doesn't really with the Germans. There's one particular bit that I liked when, um, because what it does is put like the human, like I said before, like the characters are great because they are like real people in, in these horrible circumstances. And there's one, it's very good. This film at doing little, little touches of humanity. And there's one point where, um, and like an older mother, I think it's her husband who was a general or something. She gets a box with his ashes in and it's just got this kind of bureaucratic note attached to it. And the, the box arrives on the dinner table and she doesn't, she almost like sort of embraces it. But of course it's just a box with his ashes in or his remains at any rate. And then she kind of thinks better of what it is she's about to do and just kind of, sort of folds her hands and looks at it because it would be absurd to, to, but her her kind of her kind of emotion her, her she wanted to just cuddle it because that was what represented her her man but of course it is just like a box he's not there anymore and she kind of caught herself and i thought that it's it's full of really nice little touches like that where you can think god it really is awful and and what happens is that the 
there's a it's it's quite confusing, especially I found with the subtitles. But what happens is that you follow the stories of two of Polish officers, and um they're not all gonna die. It's mainly the higher ranking officers um and professional types that the Soviets would see as the bourgeoisie, and they get uh, these terms that you hear over the Soviet Union, so they get liquidated. Is, is like this typically barbaric phrase that they use. Uh, so, but then if you're like a sort of lower ranking, just you know, you, you you're just standing there with a rifle. They they then it's like they'll ship you into um, the gulag. Then you'll be on the you'll go into the Soviet Union itself. You'll head into the belly of the beast. But what happens in the film is that one of them is cold and they swap over uh, sweaters. He gives him a sweater to wear, and it's got the the name on it. So he he's actually wearing another man's name, and this means that um, there's a mix up with their identities, and one of them gets shot, and the other one gets free, and he ends up working for the the Soviets because they've kind of he he kind of he survives it, and he gets out of the camp, and they take him on, and he goes back as a kind of enforcement officer. Um, in the Soviet, sort of like in the Polish contingent of the the, the Soviet Union, and the, so now he's actually on the side of the people of the you know the the the, the empire that um, he knows massacred the officers because he was there. So he he kind of so then he has these painful conversations with the wife of the one that died, and he has to say like, don't. Don't don't hold out any hope. He is dead, and it's it's a it was a kind of mix up, and it should have been me. And then he um he can't he can't he can't live with it, and he shoots himself outside of a outside of a pub. So it, it it's grim, but it's 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 very kind of the 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 human element in these horrible circumstances is very well done. Like, yeah, I do like how the film concludes that um. Uh, when when some when the the family members the wives of the men who were who died were given some like mementos like you said like one woman was given the ashes so uh, the main woman uh, Anna who was the uh, like the main uh, character the main her her husband was like the main officer the one who uh, was given the sweater and who actually died uh, but she was holding out hope that he had survived the war because his name wasn't on the list whereas this guy who survived his name was on the list because her husband was wearing the sweater. Um, the way that, uh, it's revealed is that, so this is after, uh, the narrative has flipped after the, the, they've, the, the Soviets have taken over and they've now said that, uh, well, the, the massacre was actually committed by the Germans. Uh, our investigation found that it couldn't possibly have happened, uh, before, um, uh, uh, summer or fall of 1941, meaning that they, they did it while, while they were, um, they, they did it while um, they had occupied the Soviet, that Western part of the Soviet Union. Uh, the way it's revealed to her, I mean, even though, of course, they it, everyone probably knew by then, is that she actually gets his diary and that uh, her husband, the officer, he was writing a diary about like, you know, what are they doing with us? Where are they sending us? They were like, because uh, they, they didn't know. None of them knew until, until they actually got there and were shot. They didn't know what was going to happen with them. Uh, He's writing a diary about like, oh, where are we being taken? Now, it looks like we're being taken to, to Smolensk. Uh, and then uh, the diary which she receives from him, it ends in uh, spring of 1940. There was no more entries after that, meaning that it had to have been before Barbarossa, meaning it had to have been when they were under, uh, when they were Soviet, there were POWs of the Soviet Union, Union, meaning that it had to have been that, it had to have been them. But uh, she has that like memento basically just confirming uh, the truth about this, but this is something that she'll never be able to speak because now this uh, they, they have this official truth, which is unspeakable in Poland after the war. Yeah, like in in this, um, it's really important. Did like dates play a really major role in this, and you have to pay attention to the dates because the the date they they can't really lie about who was in charge of Poland on certain dates. So if you get a diary back from an officer who's dead and you can see that it went up to um, 
you know, like nine, nine, at the end of 1940, and you know that he was in the eastern part of Poland in 1940, and that's when the diary ended. That means he died then, but it also means that he died under Soviet occupation and not German occupation. And of course, they don't want you to see that. And there's one part where um, the Germans are um, asking a woman about what, what, like, well, where's your husband? And they they actually take her, they show her the footage. So they've um, she she doesn't. Well, how does that go? She doesn't. She doesn't want to admit to the truth. Um, she doesn't want to take agree with what they have to say, isn't it? So then the, she is led down to uh, uh, basically like a mini cinema, and the Germans are saying, "This is what we've discovered in Kachin." To the east like you've got to see this is the reality of it this is what's happened to your officers and i thought of myself as well like because i remember all of us this this is this is where this can all, all of us as uh as westerners we have uh, unless you're very old um we have kind of in school we were bombarded with images of grainy black and white footage of piles of bodies, which, because of what we were taught and educated on, it wasn't actually the Kachian massacre. It was a far more controversial thing that happened or alleged or whatever in World War II. So, so what I'm saying is that, um, and I remember the first time I saw it, I found it absolutely horrifying to see that grainy black and white footage of just big like, bodies being sort of where you've got like mechanical equipment like diggers and bulldozers just churning up like all these piles of bodies and i thought that was absolutely horrific and of course that when you're taught that when we've been taught that there's a specific reason for that there's a specific reason why they want to ram that into our heads it isn't related to catching it's related to something else but I was thinking when I saw that part where the woman goes down, like the effect that that would have had on her. Because um, back then, um, in, in 1941, I think it would have been, they, they they would never have seen anything like that before because he wouldn't have had access to like, mass media. And it, it would have been truly traumatic to see something like that for the first time on the screen, I think. Yeah, so, so the reason that she didn't want to... Uh to to basically say what they were what they wanted her to uh was because um you know this is like another interest a, a really interesting theme of the movie so the germans basically wanted to record this and they had a they had basically a script so uh they had like questions they were going to ask her but they had already written out the answers that she was to give and it was because they were basically just going to use this as propaganda so yeah. the germans had uh decided they they basically caught on to this and said okay this is gonna like gonna be a way that we're, we're gonna be able to drive a wedge between the Polish, uh, the Western Allies, and the Soviet Union. Who you know they were all they were fighting every they were fighting them all at once. Uh, and like even like there's a scene where like they say like our you know mustache man uh, he he sends his uh, he sends his uh, his um, personal um, sympathies that, uh, about your loss and stuff like that. Like that that's obviously completely, that was obviously completely a b bullshit. Like, uh, <laughs> but uh, it basically what they were going to do is their plan was to take this, uh, take this uh, massacre and basically use that uh, and, and put it absolutely everywhere to drive it uh, home. And I think that the reason that she was reluctant to uh, actually give uh, them what they wanted is that um, basically she, she knew that they just wanted to use, um, to basically use her husband's death more as like a, a tool of propaganda. And then they basically showed her the, that footage as kind of like a uh, emotional like battering ram. Like, this is what, this is what happened. And th you know, this is why you must, you know, you must cooperate with us. And this is where the, th this is a theme that's really interesting because um, I don't know if you caught this, but did you catch that they had those two different videos? So the Germans produced a video of the Catherine massacre in 1943. Yeah which uh, had like, which it was all this detailed, like, look at what the, the Bolsheviks did. And then uh, the Soviets in 1945, when they took over, they produced, they went back to the site, they dug it up yet again, they did their own, you know, phony investigation. And then they created uh, another film, 
and that's when saying, well, like, well, this is what they did. But one thing, I was, one detail wise, I thought was was incredible. Uh, I, I love that they put it in here because it really strikes out this theme that in the German video they say the the soldiers were shot in the back of the head, the bullet uh, leaving through the forehead, a common a common known Bolshevik uh, execution method. And then in the Soviet video. Uh, it, it says the, the soldiers were shot in the back of the head. The bullet leaves through the forehead, a common known Gestapo yeah. execution method. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like uh, w w what it shows here is that it's the um, it's kind of like this uh, cynical uh, usage of uh, like horrific events like tragedy uh, for uh, surely like cyn uh, cyn uh, cynically using it for purely political reasons. And uh, I mean, man, do we see this stuff today? But you catch that, like you know, like I, I, the, the Germans, I don't think genuinely actually cared that much. They they saw the propaganda uh, value. While well, the Soviets basically said, "Oh shit, this is looking bad on us. We need to create our own and then uh, and turn the narrative on them." But I mean, you see, like how cynically it's employed. I think, in fairness to the Germans, that there is, it's 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 interesting because the, the it's as if the Germans knew. Um, that the, the the Bolsheviks were barbarians, and and because I mean it, it, this comes up in the actual film as well, where when the when the Germans expose the Kachin massacre for the first time, they are saying that there's I think, a, a newsreel footage of like German uh, propaganda for for the Germans themselves, because it's all spliced together, and they see like th this is why we have to stand up to these monsters in the east. This this is the problem. The, look at what they've done. This is why our heroic uh, Wehrmacht is now uh, engaged to, to protect Europe from these barbarians. And in all fairness, like you can't help but think there is a point because I've like you know I kind of I kind of think they did do it though. They did they did do that massacre, and. Even more generally, the general kind of vibes that you get from the, the Soviet Union are that it is like just this hellish thing. There's one point when um, the, the officers, they've been captured and they're kind of chatting amongst themselves and they don't know what's going to happen. And one of them says, um, like, if you if you get vaccinated, well, and we're not talking about current affairs here, so it doesn't matter. Okay, go ahead. It, well, it's got nothing to do with this. Has got nothing to do with whatever's going on in the world right now. It's about typhus. So, if you got the injection for typhus, that's actually what that means is that they're going to send you into the Soviet Union. So you're being inoculated. Uh, they want you in, and they don't want you spreading disease once you get in there. So if you get inoculated for typhus, it means you're going to get shipped into the, the the belly of the beast. But the so. The problem is that if you're then sitting and this happens in it, you're you're sitting there thinking, well, what's going to happen to me? And your friend gets inoculated and then he's away because if they're just going to shoot you, then they're not going to bother inoculating you. That's the that's the problem. And then he realizes that his friends are they're going away, but he's still sitting there and he hasn't been inoculated. And you think. Oh, Christ, it's, it's these, it's th this kind of dread that that this whole era, this whole part of the world at that period, it, it's full of stuff like this, and it's it's really horrific. Generally speaking, the, the it is the the way that they speak in hushed tones about well, we're going to head in, we're actually going to go inside, where we are going into the Soviet Union itself. Um, and and it was it's at that point it was like fifty percent of all of the trains, which were moving around within the Soviet Union, carried prisoners of one kind or another. Yeah, uh, I, I the, they did actually try to like you know not paint them like too with too broad of a brush because there was the character at the beginning who the uh, red Ar red army officer who was actually a decent guy. That um, so Anna the the wife of the of Andre the main Polish officer. Um, Beginning, so this was still 1940, so uh, after, uh, it may have been before or after the massacre, but uh, she didn't know at the time. Basically, what he says is that they're going to, uh, you're going to be basically a target for deportation. You're uh, the wife of an officer, but if you, uh, and he said, your husband's dead, he's not coming back. Uh, if you marry me, then uh, as the wife of a Red Army officer, you're going to be, um, 
you're, you're going to you're you're going to be uh, uh, exempt from from you know a lot of the political trouble that you're going to have uh, in in the coming months. And like I'm being I'm being sent off to Finland soon to fight in the winter war, and I'm not going to be here to protect you. So uh, like th this officer was living in the was living in their house, um, and he and he and he and he genuinely actually wanted to help the family. He was doing it because he actually cared about them. It wasn't just because you know he he wanted to get with Anna. It's because he actually genuinely wanted to help them. So uh, I do like that they they add that part that it was you know they don't try to paint them with, with too broad of a brush. Yeah, it's it's slim pickings. I mean, you never find out what happened to him, but it it, it is it is slim pickings as far as that. Is. Well, I, you know, it's not like the it's not like the Germans get off scot free either because they they can't they can't do it. And and I think this gets to the real message of the movie, which is that they're trying to find a way to form a national like a national consciousness and a national myth of Poland. And and if they were left to their own devices, that would be easy enough. But they can't do that. And especially because because that by the end of the war, the you've got this the Soviet Union takes over and they 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 want to create their own kind of consciousness within Poland, which is compatible with the Soviet Union and the wider communist project that Poland so that one of the so you'll see that some of the things that uh, will be out straight away which the the, the, the Soviets didn't like are kind of region like national identities ethnic identities religion these kinds of things they didn't like any of that so they had to, they couldn't use that so they had to kind of come up with a kind of synth synthetic version but then at the same time there's a problem with that because Basically, everybody knew or at least suspected um, the truth of the Kachin massacre. So right from the start, they're trying to create this national mythos, which everybody knows is a blatant lie. Uh, and and uh, this, so this, this is this is a big problem. Yeah, because uh, like everybody, everyone knew, and even like the the elderly gentleman who I knew uh, who lived through the war, he said that everyone in Poland knew the truth about Katyn, but. They were basically. I mean, he 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 left shortly after the war ended. But he what he said was like that. Everyone they had they had no choice but to uh, basically like live within the lie. For the one reason, on the perspective of the from the polls, is that uh, they just didn't want to get. They didn't want to get uh, gulagged or just outright shot for uh, t for telling the truth about Katyn. And they do have a lot really interesting part uh, in the movie about that as well because we'll get to the part, part like of uh, the gravestone which is really fascinating but also like from the what you mentioned about like the national myth that the soviets they had this uh, the, the, the issue that they had was how are we gonna you know uh, create this mythos for poland uh which makes it uh which which will make it uh, which will allow it to basically be a part of our sphere of influence after the war like one thing that they did, which is really interesting, is like they never actually gave back that land that they annexed in eastern Poland. So what they did was they annexed a bunch of land of uh, historically German land, uh, uh, East Prussia, and um, uh, par uh, part of Kaliningrad. Uh, so now K Kaliningrad is now Kaliningrad because like it's kind of weird that they there was this uh, separated part of Germany uh, after World War One. And that after World War II, that was cut in half. Half was taken by Russia. Half was taken by uh, the by Poland because they they realized, oh, we just stole a, a ton of land from Poland. We need to give them something in return. So, well, we defeated Germany. Let's take a bunch of land from them and just tack it onto Poland and uh, expel all the and expel all the uh, ethnic Germans from from this historically German land. Um, they and w the problem is that the Katyn massacre was something that it was just completely incompatible with uh, the. Um, the, the new national uh, mythos that the, the new communist uh, regime was going to have to uh, work under. So they, so it, it's just something that needed to be uh, that, that they, that needed to be lied about because they couldn't, you, you, you couldn't possibly admit that and still, uh, and, 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 and still ha have Poland as like this member of the, um, of the, of the new Eastern uh, communist bloc. So it's something that was just like this major contradiction, which had to be uh which had to be um, done over, and even uh, no matter how crude it was, and I uh, how obvious the, the lie was, it was something that they had no choice but to go along with. Yeah, and you can see that this—it's an example of of the 
it's it's especially true of World War Two. You see, you see smaller examples of this um, on something like um, 9/11, maybe, where there's a there's a huge event happens, and then in order because because people have to live by narratives, they have to have a story that they can tell. And what you find in World War Two, which also happened in the West, is that each of the countries get a kind of mythos to, to process what happened in the West. Now, you know, in the past, I've uh, logged heads with a lot of a lot of British nationalists because I I I don't like what I I kind of coined the term bulldog nationalism because I I saw that as a re reinforcing um, kind of liberalism. And under a, a sort of civic nationalism, because because you, you your sort of narrative, your mythos, post-war mythos, is one of, of beating the bad guys who were Nazis. So therefore, um, you you kind of identify as being anti what they were. Now, if you're a, a nationalist and you're worried about something like demographics, that's a big problem because you're going to be hamstrung again and again by people turning around and saying but the, and this is exactly what happened <laughs> where well, will we fought against this kind of thing in world war ii that's not our identity and so all of a sudden the your, your kind of patriotism has this paradoxical element to it where it works against what, what like your your own nationalism and so the, the thing with poland is is kind of similar when you bring in the catch and massacre because if everybody knows that the the everybody knows that the Soviets did it, but then you're also expected to pledge your loyalty to the Soviet Union in the name of Poland. It's 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 nonsensical, and so in the end, it just has to be enforced with 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 force and with punishing people, as does, by the way, the left, uh, the, the the West's version, the West's post-war narrative. Has also got to be in for even though we pride ourselves on being liberal and all of this, there's a couple of aspects to this big story, the post-war mythos, that you're not allowed to poke a stick at. You're not allowed to question it because the whole thing will unravel and fall apart. This is why when people like the sort of centrists who think everything is about objective, uh, objective facts and this kind of thing, it really isn't. It's about stories. <laughs> it's it's about narrative. Yeah, that's much more important and and kind of than than a fact in terms of how your your civilization and how your na nation thinks about itself, and that's exactly what this movie's getting into, except from the Polish perspective. Yeah, there, there's this great uh, meme that I saw from a while ago that um, it's basically a video of some guy writing a bunch of stuff on a whiteboard, and it, but it's like sped up to like super speed, so he's writing it really fast. And what and what the caption says is history teachers explain to you how America was is was an evil empire for its entire history except for between 1939 and 1945, and that that really is what the, the narrative would be because uh, like you know the narrative we're fed in the in the West today about World War II, it doesn't really line up when you consider the attitudes that were common among the allies. Not like we're not even talking about Germany or the National Socialists or anything or the the attitudes that they had. Um, like American Krogan made this fantastic video on, uh, on the, the video game, uh, what's it called? Call of Duty, the, the, the recent one, which was just like SJW rubbish. But what was the most interesting thing about the, the, the video he made was not necessarily like the stuff about the actual video game, but, uh, like he, he, he went through like a history of, uh, race relations in the West, uh, prior to the second world war. And the, the problem is that like this mythos like doesn't line up at all with um the act like the the, the post-war mythos doesn't actually line up at all with the racial politics which were in place in uh the allied nations uh prior to world war ii and it seems like what's happened is that we've been uh like we've been like um uh, uh what's called conditioned over the, these decades to line up with that mythos rather than actually um Rather than any that actually any of that actually being true, like for example, I think that uh, if like American soldiers who fought in the Second World War, they they were not pro integration. I mean, the United States had uh, what would be called white nationalist immigration laws at the time. It was uh, European countries only, 
they had uh, racial segregation in schools uh, they and in uh, neighborhoods and stuff like that in the South. And, um, and, and the average American thought of the United States as a ethnically European nation, which, you know, had a, a few other groups uh, as a result of history. But the core identity was uh, something that was, uh, you know, racially uh, European. And that's the same. That goes the same for every single uh, Western country that fought during World War II. It's like uh, um, someone wrote in the comment, the Canadian history narrative is even worse. I mean, it's just absolutely like r ridiculous. The stuff that, that, that we're taught in Canada about World War II, it's, it's just so, like so off from reality. Like Canada prior to, um, prior to World War II had, you know, like, I'm, like just like the United States, they had what's called white nationalist uh, immigration policies. Uh, it was uh, from European countries only uh that, that that's where all the sources of immigration were from our prime minister uh w um what's his name uh king uh william lyon mackenzie king who was the, the prime minister of canada in the second world war he wrote his uh thesis in when he graduated from university in the early 1900s he wrote his thesis on why canada should not uh permit immigration from asia and he said that the reason is because it, it that they should maintain a European character of the demographics of Canada. And today this, this uh, talking point will get you likened to uh, the national socialists in Germany. But the reality is that, and, and we're, and what we're taught as well, they fought against that. But the reality is that this, like, this is kind of just, uh, was just the norm in the world before this. And uh, this narrative has just been created to basically change, to move us away from what really was the norm. And by doing so, uh, they've had to, uh, in order to do so, they've had to basically like write this uh, fic fictional history, which really doesn't line up with uh, the reality at all. You, you, you can see, you can see memes of Antifa. Um, they'll make memes where it'll be like the the Normandy landings, and it'll be the all of the the soldiers wearing a shawl, and they'll have like a caption, and it'll say something like the original Antifa, and what they mean is the American army of that time. Um, and, and which is, of course, is ridiculous because that's the demographic and the history of America, which they regard as being like racist and anti-political correctness and homophobic and all of the rest of it. That That is like what they're talking about is the racist white patriarchy. But when it suits their narrative, they'll say they were like just not much more than glorified Antifa. But because, and then you'll also get sort of like sort of people who think they are based right wingers, uh, the, the sort of normie cons and they'll be they'll post pictures of the day day landings and people wearing a shawl and it'll be like this is the true spirit of a of our you know this this is what we're all about these boys are heroes and everything but and 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 so what you find is that they are both uh, like appropriating the world war ii mythos to their own ends because it, that that is the ground zero for the world that we live in today that is what the meta narrative is based on I mean, there's a there's a point in the just to get back to the movie for a second. There's a part where a young man is being interviewed, and um, he he basically says that his uh, he he's, he it's for is this the the thing that you were going to talk about with the gravestone? Oh, you but go he, ahead, yeah. Well, well, I was going to say that the the young son he puts down on a on a form that his father was killed uh, by the Soviets at Kachin. And there's a, a woman in there who's a sort of bureaucrat. Uh, I think she's Polish, but she's obviously, she knows which side her bread's buttered on. And her response, I thought, was interesting because she doesn't threaten him or anything like that, but she uses this kind of passive-aggressive kind of language. And it's, it's sort of like, are you sure you want to do that? Like, do you really want to do this? Like... You know, do you, have you thought about the consequences for your actions? And I thought this is the exact kind of sort of narrative control that we have. You know, if, if you say something which is maybe a little bit, a little bit politically incorrect, it, it's it's kind of like that. Do you really want to go there? Do you really want to open this can of worms for yourself? And for the most part, which it is, I mean, it is political correctness, just in in a different kind of guys to what we're used to today but it is this kind of policing this bureaucratic administrative way of of gently passively policing 
what amounts to like real big issues. And it's like, well, do you really want to do that? Is it is it worth it? Is it is it really? And and most people are like, well, yeah, maybe not. Maybe maybe it's just not worth it, you know. And this is how the the, the this is how this functions. This is how people are controlled. Yeah, there was this great meme going around a, a year or two ago. It said it was a tweet that said a black woman invented the telescope. You may not think this is true. You may have plenty of evidence to suggest that it's not true. But do you really want to lose your job over this? So, yeah, you're just going to say that a black woman invented the telescope. Uh, and, and this kind of is how it, it works in the West today. One thing interesting in that scene is that um, that woman, she was Polish, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so she... Um, basically said that he, uh, what, what the young boy said was uh, he was like a lot more idealistic. He said, well, when Poland is free, then, then, you know, the truth will come out. Like he's thinking that, uh, yeah, we're occupied now, but you know, eventually we're going to, we're going to overthrow this occupation, you know, uh, and uh, we're going to, and the truth's going to get out. And she just, and she just like uh, looks out the window and she says, Poland's never going to be free. It's, it's never going to happen. We just kind of got to go yeah. along with this. This is just the way it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, the fascinating thing is that, like towards the end of the movie, they, those aren't uh, Russians or Soviets who are pushing this stuff on them. It's actual Poles who are uh, pushing these uh, the, the false narrative based on the new uh, to prop up the new regime. Now I know historically, if we look into you know Poland in the uh, for, late forties and early fifties, let's just say a lot of the people who were uh, administering it weren't actually Polish themselves. But that's beside the point, though, because, uh, you know, there, nonetheless, there actually were Poles who, who actually did side with the with the new regime. Uh, my um, uh, the, the elderly gentleman who I know was actually uh, turned in by someone who uh, who he had fought with, uh, who, had, who he had fought alongside during the war, who uh, now wanted to make his way with the new regime. And he turned him in. And that's why he had to leave the country. So it's not like there there weren't uh, people who were who you know were sided with the new power structure. Yeah, but there's this. So this is where this is what why this film's so great and and interesting because there's an argument to be made that it's more pragmatic and sensible to just go along with the lie. So one point, and I put this in the asked a few of the the, the Christians in the uh, you know in our circles yesterday. There's a part in the film with the priest. I mean, do you want to get into that? Because I thought that was absolutely fascinating. The the one of the one of the women, uh, I think it's the one who's uh is she the daughter or the wife? But she she basically has a plaque to say that she wants the priest to the Catholic, it's Poland, and she wants this plaque put on the wall to say that um was it her father or husband was murdered by the Soviets in 1940? And which one was it? I think that it was her uh, father, I believe. Yeah. And so what's what matters here, just to put a bit of context in, is that the, the other priest, he actually went to the mass grave when the Germans first discovered it, and he consecrated it. It's on it's on film. Um, he was the one, and he said, this is, this is a crime against humanity. This is disgraceful. He gave the last rites um, over the, the mountain of corpses. And then, of course, um, he mysteriously gets taken away when the Soviets rock into town. And then there's you're left with this younger one. And so he's put on the spot because he knows the truth. He knows who really did the massacre. And now he has this young woman saying, I have a plaque here, which is saying, um, uh, you know, we, it, it wasn't the Germans. We, even if we hate the Germans, fair enough, but the, it's not true. We can't live a lie. And so the this puts the, the, the priest, I thought, in a horrible position because on the one hand, he he can't, and that's why I asked a few of the, the Christians who are more clued up on these things. And it's it's because he on the one hand he can't lie because he, he can't he can't give he can't peddle half truths or he can't mislead people. On the other hand, if he does uh, put the black the plaque up in the church. He's going to be carted off to the gulag or just shot. And so it's it's like the, the people are in these impossible situations. And what he says, the response that he gives is that he's got more. Um, 
he, the living deserve his attention and his care more than the dead. So I, th I thought that was a very good and very honest and clear answer. I think it's pragmatic, but he can still kind of save his soul as well. If you are going to be a little bit harsh, you could say that was a bit of a cope, but I actually believe it. But the, 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 the wider point is that it, there's there's an argument which says if you go if you oppose the Soviet Union you're just going to die, like you know, it's, it's as simple as that. So and this is a recurring theme within the film is that there's a lot of people making these kinds of arguments, these appeals to pragmatism, which is related to the the story you just told where that woman that bureaucrat is kind of like well Poland's never ever going to be free again so just forget it. And so you're like, well, if that's the case, and at that time it certainly did look like the case, and they wouldn't actually be free again for decades and decades, then it's kind of like, well, you're going to have to, you're going to have to just make the best of things as they are, lies and all. Otherwise, everybody's just going to end up crushed by this disgusting machine. And um, so, so you can't actually make an argument for pragmatism just to survive. And this is a recurring theme as well, as if to say, well, it's easy It's easy to demonize everybody who goes along, and you can call them traitors, but at the end of the day, you, you just have to survive. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's interesting uh, when you compare that to the present day. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out was that, yeah, when they were making these decisions, like Poland would be, would be under occupation for another 44 years, uh, meaning that... It, it, like most of these people would probably live the bulk of their lives under that uh, under communist rule, meaning that you know, it, and this was like 1945, the very beginning of it. So, uh, do you throw away your life like in the name of the truth, which will not, uh, you know, for decades later, de until decades later? You know, it seems like it's uh, today. That seems like it would have been a noble thing to do, but there's no way they could have ever even foreseen that. Is is it something you you? Uh, you, you take a stand on or are you more pro, pra, pragmatic about it? And you can think of it like today with, uh, think of uh, all the lies that were fed today. You know, now all of us like to think of ourselves as these like, you know, brave truth tellers. People are like standing against a, syst a system based on lies, an evil system, that being like global homo today. Uh, and I, cer I certainly think there, there's something noble about that. But we too also have to be pragmatic in certain ways. Like for example, uh, when your mother like starts talking about like I don't know how oppressed black people are or something like that or like is it really worth like getting into an argument with your mother over stuff like this is it worth like getting your fa getting your family members to hate you over that now I do think that like some people do have to just take a stand but I think you have to be pragmatic about it that you know uh, like for instance you you shouldn't let your kids go to a school where they're going to be indoctrinated and uh, and taught to hate themselves and then. Uh, taught to be LGBT and things like that. That's something that I think you absolutely must take a stand against. But then, you know, like when with these like just brief interactions uh, with like your family members or stuff, do you really have, do you really need to go balls to the walls on this? Do you really need to red pill your, your family members about, um, you know, like race and IQ or, um, or things like a uh, other events during World War II, do you really need them to know the absolute truth about this? And I, I, I think that you kind of do need to take a more pragmatic approach because we are in a pretty similar situation today. Using fake names on the internet like we are now is just pragmatic. I mean, you know, I'm in the Hope Not Hate annual report every year. I don't know why, because my content is like not that edgy anymore. But I, I, I am. The, I'm a marked man. I'm in the hope not hate report every year. And so if if my if people did a Google and they want they want me doxxed as well. They they do like an appeal. So what what they really want is that when people Google Morgoth's reviewing, my real name comes up. And so then if I'm gonna go um, and try and rent a flat or get a job, and you know, then it's I'm gonna be like it's gonna come up far right extremist. And and th so this is this kind of passive aggressive way that the system makes your life like unbearable in this in this kind of low key insidious way, where it becomes increasingly difficult for you just to have a normal life. And some people might make the argument that well, if you're using a fake name on the internet, well, you're a coward. You're hiding behind this name. You're you're like uh, not like going out there. And but then like. It, 
I, I just feel like uh, you, we actually need to be pragmatic. Like you and I are both like commentators online. We don't, we're not really like uh, IRL acti activists or anything like that. And I do think there do there does need to be people whose names are out there, and there are many. There are many, and many of them are doing great work. But um, not that I want to make this a stream about us and us in particular. But you know, like I just don't see what the advantage would be that I'm like taking a stand uh, uh, and like just doing it proudly. Well, all that would have really happened. Now I'm in a bit better of a situation because I wouldn't, re the only thing that would really happen to me would be like some of my family members would get angry at me, but uh, I've made, I've, I've got, uh, I thankfully I'm in a situation where like, you know, well, I live in Russia, so nobody gives a shit about uh, any of my uh, political views. And most people actually agree with me, but um, I mean, it's, well, I just, don't, I, don't, I don't see the benefit of it that really well, what I will say before we get too carried away on that line, though, is that the, when you when you look at how bad totalitarianism can get, as depicted in this film, and and the wider of the wider kind of everything that happened in World War Two and before it and after it, but in particular for me, the Soviet Union, like people people. I just want to sort of push back a little bit on on because it could be conceived as if we are kind of framing it as if we're living in the equivalent of the Soviet Union, and we're really not. I think um, we can complain about how the global homo. We can complain about the horrible policies which are implemented, the demographics, the mass immigration, the hate speech law, the whole lot. We can we can take all of it, um, and and it's 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 nothing compared to how sadistic and, and brutal the Soviet Union was. It, and and it, you watch this, the, the, the last uh, sort of 10 to 15 minutes, it's just, it's, just, it's just all of the officers just being shot through the back of the head. Like you, you're just treat like, like cattle. Um, and and we, we don't have that. Uh, so you, I think, you, you know, it's, it's all well and good to say, oh, woe is me, everything's so horrible. And it is in the West. But it's not the worst ever. It's, it's it, you know what I mean. It's yeah, not, I, it's nothing compared to like Alexander Solzhenitsyn's the things he talks about, where you're gonna get a knock on the uh, on your door in the middle of the night, and you're gonna be you're gonna take be taken out of your bed with your woman, and you're just never gonna see anybody ever again, and you're gonna be worked to death and starved to death in Siberia. That's it. You're done. You're done, and he even says, like, if we like, in um, the Gulag Archipelago, if only we'd known beforehand. You know, there were so many of them sitting around, thinking that when they, when you got the knock on the door, if only you kind of jumped through the window and made a run for it. At least, at least, you know, maybe you'd get captured, maybe you wouldn't. But the vast majority of people just went sheepishly off to never see their families again. Yeah, I made a video about the, the Gulag Archipelago um, about a year a, a year or two ago, um, and yeah, I, I basically made a video about like the comparisons between it and the West today. But I had I had to basically say, yeah, uh, but it hasn't gotten this bad yet. Like it, 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 the stuff that he describes is absolutely horrendous. Uh, but I, I definitely recommend everyone read the book, The Gulag Archipelago, if nothing, if, if for nothing else, uh, as a warning of how bad things actually can get. And uh, we're not quite, the West is not quite there yet. Um, the other thing I wanted to point, bring up was that um, the theme of power versus truth. Because um, one th conclusion that I've come to is that over the last few years is that political power will beat truth every single time. And uh, just having the evidence, having the evidence, it doesn't matter how much evidence you have. If you don't have the, if you don't have political power, if you don't have the clout, then your evidence doesn't mean a thing. Now, uh, I don't. Again, I don't want to make the stream about this, but let's like say, for instance, um, let's say that if um, Russia finds a bunch of things that uh, in the present day, let's find, let's say that Russia finds a bunch of horrible wrongdoings that the West is doing in Ukraine. Like, let's say that, for example, uh, they um, they find these chemical weapon labs, which was rumored to be to have happened and let's say that they they bring in all of like the experts and they they publicize all of it they they make this known to the world that is never going to be considered legitimate because they do not have the geopolitical clout which the west has so nothing that they ever said like, like you know today in the west they just say that like 
something was said by Russia, therefore it's automatically incorrect just because of who said it. And uh, you, what you see here is that in like, that's, it's an example of how political power always supersedes truth. And it doesn't really matter what evidence you can bring up. And like uh, Catlin is a good example of this, that, you know, everyone knew damn well who, who uh, committed the Catlin massacre, but you weren't allowed to say it. And like another thing I, I, I saw, I just, well, just, um, while reading through the Catton Massacre uh, page on Wikipedia, and now this relates to other events in World War II, which we can't talk about too much, but um, one thing that it said there was that, well, it, it helped the Germans because it was proof that Bolshevism was was brutal, uh, so it was useful for them. But then, like, it, it doesn't say that, well, that was confirmation that Bolshevism was brutal. It says that it helped the Germans claim that it was brutal. Now, if you search any Wikipedia pages about the uh, war crimes that the Germans allegedly committed, you're never going to see anywhere that like, well, this was beneficial for the the um, the allies because this was this helped them prove that um, this helped them create propaganda to say that national socialism was brutal. Like, it's just assumed that well that that is um, that's confirmation of such. Whereas if it's something that uh, someone who doesn't have the political clout, uh, a, a group that's considered to be illegitimate be it, you know, Germany in World War II, Russia in the present day, or anyone really that, that doesn't have the power, that doesn't have political power. Uh, w no matter what they say, it's not going to be considered legitimate because they can present all the evidence in the world, but ultimately what it comes down to is who has more power and they decide the proof. I mean, just, just imagine the mental somersaults that somebody in the West, say you're like, you're, you're a normal bloke reading your Daily Telegraph in Somerset, uh, throughout these years um so obviously you're on the side of britain you're seeing it from the perspective of a, like a little englander so when <clears throat> originally the the first kind of thing is where the the Na the nazis have discovered kachin and they are saying that look what the soviets have done this is barbaric so your take on that on the narrative there would be to just not believe what the germans are saying and assume that the germans are telling lies and that it was they had done it, and that they're trying to blame it on the Soviets, who at this time were your allies. <clears throat> so then the Soviets come rolling in, and they uh, say, well, the Germans have done it, and then that's fine, so that goes along with your narrative, so you'll believe it again. But then you get to the Nuremberg trials, and for some reason the, the, the catch in Moscow was quietly dropped, because obviously then the Nazis are on trial. So amongst all of the other crimes um, that they that were being like leveled against them, for some reason they just somebody somewhere decided that they it was there it was in the list, but somebody somewhere decided let's let's just not poke at that let's let's just let let's let's not draw too much attention to that particular issue. Eh? So then you get to the 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 post war era. Uh, Stalin kind of goes rogue, and he, 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 you get the Cold War proper, and then all of a sudden it's, oh, well, I'll tell you what, let's have another look at what really happened in Katja. So then by the time you get into the 50s, you get into the height of the Cold War, it would probably be like, you know, it would be like, well, maybe the Russians did do that then. And it all depends on political expediency in the Western world. Yeah, and I find that, like, uh, you can, it's comparable to events like, uh, like January 6th, um, Charlottesville, things like that today, like that these events will be, uh, ta they'll, they'll be taken hold of. And then what becomes the truth uh, is just whatever the, the regime wants it to be, uh, whatever they want it to be. So uh, we've, there's these guys on the online who have uh, spoken until they were blue in the face about what has actually happened, what actually happened at Charlottesville, let's say. Like you can find, I, I kind of lost interest in the topic a long time ago but you, you there are like probably about a hundred hours worth of live streams from our guys documenting all this stuff and explaining what actually happened but for 99 percent of the population of the united states what happened at charlottesville was a bunch of white supremacists showed up they tore up the town and they killed this uh they killed this one woman and uh this is proof that uh, white supremacists are the most dangerous thing in America. And, and then, you know, it's a similar narrative with uh, uh, January 6th. I mean, like you, you had Kamala Harris comparing January 6th to 
Pearl Harbor and 9-11. And, you know, 9-11 is another interesting uh, event like this. But uh, you see that these kind of these events just become uh, they, they just become these political footballs, which are used for uh, which really the, the event itself doesn't matter in so much as it can be used for uh, political purposes in the present day. Yeah, I mean, this is in the age of the Internet as well. When you go back to, um, say, World War Two era and especially when you're looking at the because it, it was like remote villages in the east in russia in eastern europe where their uh, their access to information and news would be really scant they'd just be literally just reading propaganda pamphlets that were coming in off uh, from the local kind of administration that that would be and then like gossip and hearsay around the village or something so it, i think it would be really easy to to manipulate them one way or another to be honest but what we've got now of course is the, the whole thing that you see now is where the the, the, the the power center kind of struggles to maintain control over its own narratives i think they've actually conquered that in the last few years over all of the different you know that we support the, the the same thing with enough censorship and tweaking with the algorithms and uh, all of that they've, they've managed to kind of get on top of it and create this kind of insane world that we're in now where everything has to be cranked up to, to maximum capacity all of the time. But I, that it, it would be different back in the uh, these, these kind of blood-soaked corners of uh, Eastern Europe. I mean, in preparation for this, I read, um, there's a book by Niall Ferguson, and he's, I've read it, like I say, I've read a lot of books on this subject, and I've still got them kicking around. And I picked up the there's a book by Niall Ferguson who's a he's a kind of a normie con. It, it's and, and there's a lot in it that irritates. And, you know, he he is like an establishment kind of guy. Um, and and there's certain there's a certain group that pops up over and over again. Though some of it's quite based. I was taken aback by some of it, especially at who was the original person who invented the gulag and why. But um. What 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 is good about that War of the World book is, it I read it when it first came out. I picked it up at an airport in like two thousand and six, and what he's talking about is that the, his general kind of thesis is that the twentieth century was um, more blood soaked than all of the other eras of humanity put together. And he goes into detail about what happened and why. And much of the book, I'd say more than half of the book, is in at some place in Russia or Eastern Europe. Then he goes over to places like Japan. So, but what he what he really gets into some of it is absolutely the reason why I remember it is because the, the the savagery and the barbarism that that he describes, like that is what what's good about the book is that there, there's stories of like women from Ukraine and Poland. There's a story of women having like cats sewed into their bellies and things like this um all referenced as well you know it's real real just sadism that, that i'd never even thought about before and for me when i read that book now what he he is a kind of classic liberal and he was um so this is like when i was becoming aware of a lot of things and he the way he's looking at it is, is that like we have to move on be beyond this you know we we have to take we have to learn the lessons from um from the way ethnic groups will turn on each other with this kind of barbarism and we have to learn from the 20th century as we move on as like one humanity kind of thing and when i was reading it i thought i came to the complete opposite conclusion <laughs> I, I when I was so horrified by some of the gore and and torture and violence in the book that I basically became like a nationalist straight away because I thought well the most obvious thing here is for everybody just to have their own place because the, his whole point like the point that he was making as a liberal was that when you cobble together all of these different peoples and the borders you know after World War One with Versailles. People tend to forget, but it was classic liberals who were making ethno states all over Europe. It was classic liberals 
who were looking in this kind of empirical, kind of technocratic way and saying, well, okay, so this ethnic group belong here and this ethnic group, and we'll just kind of draw lines all over and we'll do mass depopulations here and there. And this this is like for the greater good because it, it just makes sense that when everybody's with their own kind, there's going to be less violence. And they made a bit of a mess of it, but you can see what they were thinking. And that that was that was classic liberals who did that after World War One, not ethno-nationalists, not nationalists. And the conclusion that I got from Niall Ferguson's War of the World was just that, that um, everybody should have their own place and be with their own kind to prevent barbarism. And I, I stand by that to this day. And I've never been proven wrong. It, it's it, you can see it. You can see just what happened in um, America yesterday with that shooting, and it's there's these these tensions all of the time. And I just thought it's interesting that he's coming at this from this. He's kind of he's kind of admitting he's kind of admitting that the nationalists are right, um, but but as a liberal. And yeah, here's something that also I, I thought of. Now I'm not touching the, the the shooting from America yesterday. I'm not interested, not going to even, I'm not getting into that uh, circus yet again. But uh, it, did, it did make me think of like, so basically what you have in the movie is there's the, the there's a, the three factions. There's the, uh, the Soviets, the, the Poles and the Germans. And uh, basically they're all at war with each other. And uh, needless to say, these people all hated each other. You know, the, uh, going back to my boyhood uh, role model, uh, he didn't like Germans and he didn't like Russians till the day he died. He did say that, like, you know, the average soldier was a, a, a decent person and there were decent people. Uh, there were decent Russians and there were decent Germans as well. But, uh, you know, he said, like, for the um, the political officers on uh, the Gestapo agents and for the end, the commissars and the NKVD guys, he said, you know, they were not, uh, they, they were not really pleasant, but uh, nonetheless, so what you see is with, with this cat and massacre that uh, they um, it's kind of being cynically employed both first by the Germans and then by the Soviets as kind of like taking this like horrible event. And then it's using it kind of as political ammunition. And uh, to, on your point that, you know, uh, the, way to, the way to avoid this kind of barbarism is to have uh, ethnically homogenous nations where people do, uh, don't have these, this ethnic strife, strife. And I just think that I just wonder today, like, you know, with uh, all like we always see this in the United States. There's some shooting that happens or maybe in Britain, it might be some Islamic terrorist attack or something like that. But nobody anymore actually cares about the actual attack what actually people care about is how they can use this event as political ammunition and uh you know i, I think that maybe both the left and the right are guilty of this but um it never dawns on anyone anymore that like you know this that somebody died or something like that uh it's kind of just taken uh, as well how well this is going to be uh uh this is going to be good political capital for my side. And that I think really uh, speaks to like the, the, the issue in the West today. I feel like everything kind of is becoming this kind of like cat and mat, uh, cat and uh, like situation where they, they got to get a hold of any kind of story. And it's just used as political ammunition for this endless, like uh, back and forth political fight between groups who hate each other, who now uh, uh, inhabit the same nations. Uh, I, I think it was Jonathan Bowden that said that, you know, um, what uh before but the 20th century was the was um the conflicts of the 20th century were, were between different nations but the world that they, that has been set up post world war ii is going to make the conflicts of the 21st century within nations and it's because they've they have this like universalist egalitarian worldview that you can just put everyone together and then that's like uh that's somehow going to work whereas uh, it just doesn't work like that. You know, I think that in a homogenous, healthy society where people all had like this shared identity and they actually and uh, they actually felt at home, you know, if there was an event which, you know, let's say like 10 or so people died, everyone would actually like feel a sense of like uh, grief over that. Where, whereas today, is it's just, it's immediately, how can this be used politically? Am I going to be on the offensive or on the defensive? Like, even like, a, a even 20 years ago in America, when 9-11 happened, now, 
we all I, now I know there's a lot of shady things about 9/11 too, but at least back then it wasn't like immediately used uh, to get everyone to hate each other. Now it was used for nefarious purposes, as in like justifying wars in the Middle East. But at least back then, like people didn't hate each other to the degree today where. As I think that if 9-11 happened today, it would just be used uh, like who, whose fault is it? Is it the Democrats' fault? Is it the Republicans' fault? Like the world that's been created, we're just in this constant, like endless political struggle because the societies are full of everyone, of people who hate each other now. Yeah, yeah, it, that, that's exactly what it is. Like the actual people who died, it's like, well, that, that that's not important. What matters is the narrative, as I said before. I mean, on the, on the, the kind of the multicultural empire thing as well, you know, the funny thing is, the the like one of the one of the best examples that you can give of it actually working, and to some extent, um, is the Soviet Union itself. Now, what that required was Joseph Stalin, and you had all of these small um, ethnic groups, especially in the south of Russia, and there was he he would enact policies where there was whole nations just disappeared. So <laughs> their literature, their folklore, and their myth would all be confiscated and burned. Their language would be banned. And then the people would be put on cattle trucks and then dispersed all over the Soviet Union where they would just like mix in with whoever was there. So you would have like distinct peoples within a generation or two just disappeared, just completely disappeared. But in theory, this is what it takes to make this, the kind of the multicultural myth work. <laughs> but the West haven't got the stomach for anything of the sort. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, but, but then, you know, it, uh, it all comes down to like, you know, uh, power. Are, are they actually going to go through with it? You know, uh, thankfully they, they haven't, they haven't gone through with that yet, but you know, things aren't, things aren't looking, or things certainly aren't looking pretty uh, for the future. Uh, and uh yeah, I I, I think that uh, I think we we've pretty much covered the the film. Is there anything you wanted to add um, to finish about Captain? Not really. I mean, I was thinking as well of the I, I I do have I do have like real bad vibes from the Soviet Union. And I know that some people on the right are kind of a little bit sympathetic because it can come across as based. I mean, one thing I'll say is that you know when you hear that thing about like the fox and the lion. Uh, where so in this case, Joseph Stalin would have he would have started out as a fox, meaning that he was good at manipulation and being behind the scenes, um, and, and kind of doing things in this passive way. And he emerged as a lion, which means he would just use brute force to, to get his will. And almost no king or emperor um, in the history of the world has had the absolute power that Joseph Stalin had. And the idea is that, well, when, 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 because the a criticism of Western liberalism is that it's, and I've made this a lot, is that it's very difficult to hold people to account. So, who is in the end responsible for the, the policies, the multicultural policies, for example? Where, where, who is responsible for that? Where do you pin the blame on something? If there's a terrorist attack in the West, uh, by somebody who shouldn't be here. Like, who is in the end responsible for that? And it's actually really difficult to kind of pin that down directly on somebody who's made a decision because you, you, it's, it's like a system and not an individual. So in the case of the Soviet Union, you do have an individual. You do have somebody who's right at the top with absolute power and authority, but he's not going to be held accountable. And you've also got the gigantic bureaucratic machine under them so it's like you've got the, the <laughs> you've got the worst of everything you've got an autocrat who can't be touched and who doesn't care too much or, or act, maybe actively just hates everybody but then under that you've still got the bureaucratic system so nobody so nobody is going to be held to account still under that system whether he's a lion or not yeah, uh, it, it is also important to say that, like, you know, the so this Soviet history isn't just not not that I want to defend like the Soviet Union or anything like that, but I will say that, like, you know, it wasn't like that the entire throughout the entire history, like the six the seven the sixties, seventies, eighties. I mean, it was still like an authoritarian. Uh, it was still yeah. an authoritarian regime, but it wasn't like you know, like the gulags were shut down in nineteen sixty. So yeah, I mean. Um, I saw somebody in the chat earlier saying that they'd probably rather live in the Soviet Union than the West now. Now, if you get into the Gorbachev era, 
and the West now, then I think you've got a uh, that that's that you know that would be something where you could bat it back on and forward. Is would it be better to live in the 1980s Soviet Union than in the West now? Um, then I think you've got a stronger argument. But if you you can't say with with like with serious face, you'd rather live under like Stalinism with the gulags than the West now. I, I, because he just he, he, I, I, I'm not I, I'm not sure about that. Like, yeah, I, I'd probably say like if you're gonna if if, if it's uh like six it's it's sixty seventies eighty Soviet Union. Yeah, I mean, you know a lot of people in Russia today actually are pretty nostalgic for those days, like older people. Um, uh who actually remember them, remember it quite well. I'm not saying that like it's ideal or anything, but you know, I, I, I can see, I can see the, I can see the appeal. Like, Hey, I've, I've lived in apartments that were built in the Soviet era. You know, it's, uh, it's better than the, it's better than the pods that uh, there are being built uh, in the West today to cram you in where you're going to have to eat the bugs. So I mean, yeah, I'd say if I, uh, it's just a pure hypothetical, but you know, it's, uh, it's just because, you know, it's, it, it's mainly about Poland and it is interesting that in mainly in the, um, the Soviet Union, Poland, Poland was always a problem child for them. It seems like Poland was like a constant source of headaches for Moscow up to the end of the eighties with uh, Lech Luensa and the solidarity movement, which, which was like a real problem. And, so it was as if um, you do have to wonder if it was catching, if that little kind of thing where the narrative couldn't, they couldn't quite pull that off. And it led to this constant kind of simmering as well, of course, as like the, the, the strong presence of the Catholic church who were much more, um, they were much more anti, anti-communism than what they are anti-global homo now, which is a bloody shame. But um, it is interesting that Poland was always a problem child for the Soviet Union. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, in conclusion, it's a it's a great film. I I definitely recommend it to people because, like, I, I will admit that like anything World War Two, I kind of groan at this point just because of how many idiot like uh, politicians just keep having to drag up World War Two, and now everything is always compared to it. And like, I'm I'm sick to death of it. But this one actually is something that is like that actually is fresh. So. Uh, a good a good film it's a really it's really dark uh really um uh n not not the most happy film but you know it is pretty damn entertaining yeah i mean i saw somebody in the chat saying that he made a video saying that for most people's lives in the, the soviet union it would like they would have just got on with their lives uh, again that could be the case in um in the 1980s, but I just don't believe. I mean, 15% of the population got took to a gulag. So that is actually you. Everybody would have known somebody who got carted off to a gulag. And I just, I just, no, I'm not buying that argument. Yeah. But anyway, I think that uh, it's a good time to finish the stream. Do you have any idea what we're going to be doing next month? Uh, no, I maybe I did a podcast. I'll just show me Substack where I've got an absolute ton of stuff. And I did an, um, it's a beautiful Irish movie, and I did a solo uh, podcast where I just spoke about some of the themes. It's about 40 minutes long, and I have that up on my sub stack. Um, and I think maybe we can just do a classic movies on that next thing because there's a lot of nice things in it. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. But um, you can find everything that I'm doing these days up on the sub stack, including this tomorrow uh, and you can support me for the price of a cup of coffee per month i've got written articles podcasts and all kinds of stuff up there well definitely check out morgoth and we'll be back next month with another classic movie stream we're not entirely sure what we're going to do yet but i'm sure it'll be interesting uh thanks all for right. listening everyone see y'all next you time folks.